Before I begin my talk today on the topic of Class A versus AB amplifiers, I want to just say to those people who are waiting for my video on our new Class A tube amplifier, um, that yes, it's been delayed a little bit and for reasons which I'll explain in the video, which I hope will come out around early May to mid-May, um, then we will go into all the details because you can see it as a sort of part two to this video really because I don't know why, whether it's some kind of inbuilt bias, but since I finished developing our Pearl Acoustic single driver loudspeaker back in 2013, I've always found myself drawn to Class A amplifiers. And I don't quite know what it is about that amplifiers that are so special, but I'm gonna go into some detail in this video and explain what it might well be. Also, for this video, I'm focusing purely on solid state amplifiers. In part two, in May, we will be focusing on tube amplifiers. So, without any further ado, let's get started. So, if we were to imagine two amplifiers, Let's go for, for example, the really classic Pass Labs uh, Int 25. It's a 25 watt per channel in pure Class A, and it can sort of go up to about 80 watts when it drifts into AB, but it's, you can see it as a 25 watt per channel Class A. Then I'm going to compare that, and we'll actually do some recordings of sound by side, side by side later on. We'll chapter the video so you can just flip through to that if you wish. We're going to put it up against um, the Athos amplifier from Riga, which is 125 watts per channel. So it's a much more powerful AB amplifier versus an A amplifier. They're both single-ended amplifiers with um, very similar characteristics. And that's be the first comparison. And then we're going to compare two big, beefy <laughs> power amplifiers. We'll go with the Musical Fidelity um, M8, uh, which is the M8, M58. It's the 500 watt per channel stereo amplifier, and it doubles down to 1,000 watts. Yeah, I think it can deliver over something like 200 amps. It's an unbelievably powerful thing. And we're going to put that up against the biggest Class A amplifier that I have in the listening room, uh, which is the Sugden SPA4, which is 75 watts per channel. So we'll record identical tracks playing through each amplifier. And so you can see if you can detect differences or find some commonality with what I'm saying. I know it's not serious when we play through YouTube. It's just for a bit of fun and not really strictly scientific. But a lot of you find it interesting and yeah, why not? So let's get started then. As I said, I find myself constantly going back to Class A amplifiers, and it's not really a conscious decision. It's just something I come into the listening room, I'm looking around, I tend to connect up the amplifier that I'm in the right mood for, and more often than not, it's a Class A one. And I find it interesting because obviously in the summer when it's very hot, then I don't. I, I, I stay with an AB and even sometimes a Class D amplifier for obvious reasons, because Class A amplifiers tend to give off a lot of heat into the room. Um, so I've been reflecting on this, thinking, well, why, why am I doing this? What's the hidden bias? Is it purely my imagination? And it's been inspired by a visit I've had recently from a, um, a, a customer of ours who brought an amplifier of his in. And I thought, oh, hmm, this amplifier has the characteristics of what I'm looking for in a Class A amplifier, but it wasn't. In fact, it was a, um, it was a Marantz N40, um, but it had a very wide sound stage. And I thought, oh, this could pass as being a Class A. And in fact, when I was, you know, later on in that audition, I noticed his amplifier was getting quite warm. So I've got a sneaky suspicion that maybe 
it's running in class A for the first watt or something, which is often what happens. So let me explain, first of all, the difference between the two. I won't go into too much technical details. I did make a video, which we'll just put a link to, called Watt Amplifier, where I talk about the different types. But basically, a class A amplifier is an amplifier that amplifies the whole signal in one go. So the transistors or the tubes are permanently on in full flow, waiting for something to come through. An AB amplifier, on the other hand, switches from the positive side to the negative side. Now, B amplifiers switch exactly in the line down the middle, whereas an AB amplifier tend to overlap, and this is to avoid something called crossover distortion, which has been long solved a long time ago. So some of the AB amplifiers have, have more crossover points and lower crossover distortion than others, but this is typically when you hear people talking about biasing, this is kind of what they mean. Anyway, that's more or less what I'm going to go into, but we'll put some links into some further reading for those who are interested, as I say. So, I think that when I'm listening to class A amplifiers, that our loudspeakers sound better. I think when I'm sitting in the room, I get a wider sound stage and everything seems more real. But I think it's worth maybe looking a little bit at what is sound stage. Soundstage, by definition, means the ability to realistically interpret or project into your listening room a realistic 3D image of a stage. Meaning, each instrument's nicely separated, so you can hear the singer in the middle, you hear the saxophone player slightly to the left, for example, the drummer at the back, um, and maybe uh, another player a little bit further forward, but you get a very realistic 3D image. And this is something unique that hi-fi enthusiasts can enjoy, which doesn't actually happen in real life. Let me explain what I mean. And I regularly attend the Bozar Concert Hall in the city, city of Brussels here in Belgium, a beautiful concert hall and the acoustics there are quite good but even when I'm sitting right in the middle and the symphony orchestra is filling the whole stage from left to right if I close my eyes very often I can't pick from where even the trumpet is coming from there are some anomalies for example if the put the, some of the percussion players right up to the back of the hall, right against the wooden panels, it can sound like they're playing in your head, in the middle of your head. So this notion of soundstage in a live environment is often non-existent because of all the reflections. So you have some sound coming directly from the singer, for example, to your ears. You'll have some bouncing off the ceiling, some off the side walls, some from the back. And that's why it can be a bit confusing, but you do get a kind of holistic sound. However, if you're at home and you've got a, a nicely dampened room like we have in our listening room, and nicely balanced, if your loudspeakers are set up really well, when you close your eyes, you can hear exactly where the instruments are. And that is the one thing that hi-fi enthusiasts have over the live concert goer. Obviously, the live concert goer never really notices this soundstage problem because presumably they've got their eyes open so you can see where the flutes are, you can see that the double basses are on the right and you can see that the timpani are right up in the middle and if your eyes are looking there then obviously that's where the sound is coming from so your brain is putting everything together. I think it's really interesting to look at how does soundstage work from a human point of view. Humans are very good at pinpointing where a sound comes from. It's something from our evolution and it's obvious that it's extremely important to us 
um, when we're hunting and looking out for potential enemies. So what happens is, if a sound comes from my left, it will enter my left ear very slightly before my right. The distance is really short, the difference, but my brain is able, everyone's brain is able, to detect that minuscule delay. What's more, sound from the left will have got diffused around my face, around my nose, my mouth, whatever, and will enter my ear in a different way than entering my left ear. So my right and left will receive that signal slightly differently. If you say slightly muffled on the right, very clear on the left, slightly late on the right, slightly earlier on the left. Now, depending if you've got other in a cave or against the wall and sounds bouncing in, my brain is also going to say, ah, oh, that sound is even later because it's traveled further. It's hits a wall, come in and backed in. And with this number of signals coming in and the brain says, OK, that one is a bit later than this one. This one's later than that one. And that one's later than that one. It can build a very good three dimensional image, but it can also get confused. And therefore, in the console hall, I'm not really sure where the sound's coming from, even though I can see exactly where it is. But there's another aspect to soundstage in the listening room and how we hear that I think is all equally important. And it's something I've noticed as a recording engineer. When you play a note, a high note, and you make it louder, the brain very slightly increases the pitch. It detects an increase in pitch. In fact, I think scientifically there is an increase, but it's a very small amount. And when you reduce the pressure, it drops slightly. Similarly, in low frequencies, when the pressure is increased, the pitch will tend to drop slightly, and when it's decreased, it will tend to rise back. This you can hear sometimes a bit like a Doppler effect, you know, the sound of a bell on a train when it's running away from you will drop. Even when you're stationary in a big concert hall, when the sound rises from the trumpets at the end of a big symphony on a big blast of trumpets, as it rises up and fades, you sometimes hear this, whoa, this sense of it dropping in pitch. Now that can be for other reasons as well, temperature and all sorts of things and air pressure in the room. But it's a fact that that goes on and our brains are able to detect all of these things. And with all this information, it can produce and create three dimensional images. And that's why sitting on my lovely couch here in my listening room with my eyes closed, listening to a jazz trio or to a symphony orchestra, I can hear exactly where all the instruments are. And I believed or believed that Class A amplifiers were able to do this better than AB. And sometimes when you switch amplifiers, you can really hear the difference that one of them has got wider and one of them's narrow. I have this little trick of putting on a track where there's something clear left and right. And I close my eyes and I put my hands here and I kind of line up my hands as to where I think those sounds are coming from. And when I open my eyes, I can see, oh, yes, that's beyond the left speaker and beyond the right speaker. With a single drive cone loudspeaker like we have in our Pearl Acoustic speakers, you will be surprised how three dimensional the sounds can be. With a single source, everything becomes very clear. So you can really define and you can go way beyond. And now, a lot of people have mentioned that when they're listening to our loudspeakers, and I'm sorry if this is sounding a bit like an advert, um, when they listen to our loudspeakers and they close their eyes, their speakers disappear. You don't know where they are. And that's something that we can really create in a well-designed um, room. And what you notice is when you change from one amplifier to another, it can go a little bit wider or it can seem a little bit narrower, maybe more focused. But there's an element to this discussion which I haven't talked about. And in fact, I hear almost no one talking about 
on the internet. And I blame yeah, myself too, because I haven't raised this topic before, but it's extremely important topic. And the topic is timbre. The, the sound of something. So if we play A440 on a piano or on a, a sound wave generator, you get a certain sound. A beep. It's probably not 440, but you know what I mean. You get that sound. But if we have two instruments, a piano and a cello, play the same note, they will sound com exactly the same pitch, but the sound will be completely different. And what I find interesting in this is that some loudspeakers are extremely good at detecting timbres or timbre. So, for example, if we have two guitars, two acoustic guitars, very similar make, but very slightly different or different strings on one versus the other, with our loudspeakers, you'll really hear that difference. And this is probably why the great, um, well-known hi-fi critic, um, Jamie Beesmans, when he um, reviewed our loudspeakers, he said, What's really interesting is that when you change from one amplifier to another, there's a really big difference. You can hear the different characteristics of each amplifier. Because I know there's a lot of people who say, well, it doesn't make any difference. You can't tell the difference. Well, believe me, you can. In a good room, in a good setup, you really will hear the difference. And I think it's linked to the fact that I was inspired by my microphone diaphragms when I was designing these loudspeakers because in my microphones I have a very small diaphragm for recording also there's obviously lots of different microphones but the biggest diaphragm I have is, is probably still smaller than my thumb nail and with a single diaphragm I can get everything from 5 hertz to 40,000 hertz so and I can pick up exactly the different timbres of two violins um, next to each other, my microphone will detect them exactly. We will know who's talking, who's singing, who's coming in. Is it John Lennon singing or is it Paul McCartney? The timbre of their voices is very, very clearly defined. And that's exactly what I wanted to achieve in the loudspeakers too. And so I think this is also, if class A has got something to do with it, look out and listen out in the recordings for any detection in the ability to pick out different timbres. Now, obviously with YouTube, it's, it's really, you know, all, it's, not, it's not a pointless exercise, but it's just a fun exercise. But in a serious listening room where the background noise is really quiet and you're listening, timbre is something very important. And from now on, we should, and other reviewers should also talk about timbre when they're reviewing loudspeakers. Are the triangles precise? Do they sound full? Are we getting all the harmonics that tells us, ah, that's a certain make of triangle, or this is a different kind of triangle? Can we really hear the differences between the two different types of piano between one recording and another, or two singers next to each other? A very important topic. Now, let me just check my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. So there is a, or was a very famous inventor called Christian Huygens. And Huygens, apart from inventing a new kind of barometer, which was more easy, easier to read than Tor Torcelli's, I think it was Torcelli's uh, barometer, which is just a single pipe. So he could measure very easily the difference in air pressure. He, apart from loads of other things, he also was the first person to really detect pitch and link it. He was on holiday. He was near towards the end of his life. He was 62 years old. It would have been something, I think, 1695. He was on, on or staying in Chantilly in France. And there was a big fountain, a very noisy fountain. And he noticed that the reflection from the flight of steps from the fountain was coming at him. And depending on the height of the step where it was bouncing from, he could detect a repetitive pitch, which is like, we should say, an echo. And he could detect a certain 
uh, pitch and he, he calculated the width of the stairs and the depth of the stairs and the distance and he started to plot out the reflections and started to come up with formulas for determining this. And in fact, you can get very similar effects if you're in an alleyway, for example, and you clap your hands and the sound bounces from one wall to another, you can get quite a different tone from the ones that you have in your hands. And these pitches and these reflections are also very significant in this story. And that's why I mention it, because if your room has got very dominant reflective pitches and tones, then some of the things that I'm talking about, you won't really appreciate. And that's why it's so important to try and get your room right by placing your plants or a nice oil painting somewhere or a thicker set of curtains and to create this space so you can really enjoy a three-dimensional image because you can get that from a moderately priced system. It doesn't always have to be of some really fantastically expensive system. So now let's put this then to the test. We're going to start off with the um, Riga Athos amplifier. We're going to play the um, Claire Teal track that we always use and we're going to compare it against the Riga Athos. I've got you under my skin I've got you How did that go? Did you notice a difference? Was there one that you preferred over the other? I'm very interested to know. Now, we are, I was very careful that when I set this up that the output volume was exactly the same for each one. I played some pink noise through the system and then put the CD in. So I'm very sure it's exactly the same volume. And now we're going to do the same. But this time we're going to go to the Sugden SPA4, and then play on the Musical Fidelity M8 5S. And then you can decide which one did you prefer, which did you detect any difference in the width, in the sound stage. My microphones in this room are, are quite limited. I'm using really um, a microphone technique where we place two microphones at 45 degrees with each other but it's all built in, into, into the system. Um, but it should still give some kind of impression. I've got you under my skin I've got you deep in the heart of me So deep in my So 
I try to resist when darling I know so well I've got you under my skin I've got you Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little interlude. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have been, thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one, which will be about a piece of music I still haven't chosen yet. I'm off on holiday in France next week and I'm going to choose the pieces then. And then after that one, we will be, I promise, talking about our new amplifier and class A versus uh, AB in the tube world. Okay, if you have been, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.